This is Duke University. Thank you. Um, so I didn't expect to have such a large crowd. And um, I had given a talk at Story Lab introducing the project in the beginning of the semester. I'll t say a little bit about what the project is before I um, start on the talk, which is about something much more specific. Um, every episode, so I produced 10 episodes this year at Duke. And every episode um, begins with a story. In fact, the story probably takes up half, if not more than half, of each episode. And when I say story, I mean something that um, requires some kind of journalistic research. There's a person, place, something happened. There's a conflict, right? Um, not really much philosophy there. The difference is what I tried to do is every story um, that I found has to have some kind of conflict in there that either opens up a philosophical topic or the conflict is itself a philosophical conflict. Um, that happened a couple of times over the course uh, of the season. And, and I used that opportunity to weave in um, work of contemporary philosophers um, talking about that kind of topic. Uh, you'll, you'll see some examples in a second. Um, and so today I want to talk about one issue that kept coming back over and over again. Um, it came at the, end of the, at the end of the run, which was just happened a few weeks ago. Um, I got a listener letter um, that raised this issue that I had been thinking about the whole time. And the issue really is about um, how do you integrate something like philosophy with storytelling? Um, and so the reason why this arises is because it's not just storytelling for the sake of storytelling. I have a purpose. It's a particularly idiosyncratic purpose. Um, the purpose is to, um, introduce people to not just a particular philosophical issue, but maybe even some sophisticated arguments for that. And to do it in such a way that isn't just, hey, let's talk about the possibility of posthumous harm, right? Like, what's that? Well, when you die, can you harm somebody who's already dead, right? But that's one of the issues. That was the first topic. But I didn't want to do that by just asserting here is the issue that we're going to be talking about. I wanted to show how, in a real actual story that happened, um, that kind of issue arose. Now, when that happens, and you, these are, this is the list of all of the topics from season one. Like, like so 10 episodes, possibility of posthumous harm, moral exploitation, morality of killing in war, um, naming and divinity. That was an interesting one, right? There was a lot of Duke um, interactions with that. That's where, um, what do the names in our um, religious traditions refer to, and when can two names from two different religions actually pick out the same divine being, right? Like that's a philosophical topic that people in philosophical theology have talked about. Um, the aesthetics of popular music, science versus pseudoscience. This one sounds like the most boring one, the epistemology of statistical inference. I had to find a story <laughs> that was compelling to people that opened up the epistemology of statistical inference, right? I mean, like it's like saying to somebody, I'm doing an episode on so social science research methods. Oh, that's really exciting. But I had to find that, and I had to make it compelling. Um, the construction of norms of gender through violent institutions, that was the most popular episode so far, actually. Um, epistemic objectivity in science and nonfiction film. And finally, the last episode was the philosophy of love. Um, that was an episode where I followed five different mothers through five different stages of life. So a newborn, a mother with a newborn, all the way to, well, actually mother, somebody who was mothering after her own death. Um, so um, to talk about the philosophy of love, now how do you integrate that? How do you integrate what is essentially a, um, in philosophy, what I'm going to say, what is essentially something with an aim that is different than what the aim is in storytelling? Now what's that aim? Well, I think that, um, so it's like me saying, what is philosophy, right? I think the aim um, of philosophy, or at least what we've been trained to do as philosophy professors, um, is to, well, what academics do, give reasons and arguments for a thesis, right? In philosophy, the ideas matter, but more importantly, the reasoning matters, and the evidence matters. Um, the goal, I want to say, in philosophy has always been epistemological. And the style has always been classical. Um, by epistemological, I want to say that the aim of an essay is not just truth, but um, 
justification for truth, right? Um, it's not just truth because you can have a list of nothing but truths, and that doesn't count as a piece of philosophy, right? Um, what counts as a piece of philosophy is what somebody's reasons are, um, what arguments they provide, and whether they can negotiate between those arguments and like counter arguments. And so like that's sort of the endless cycle of philosophy, argument, counter argument, objection, counter objection, and so on and so forth. So that's the aim. The style, and this is, I'm gonna talk about now writing style or uh, presentation style. Um, I think, at least in the tradition in which I'm a part, which some people call analytic philosophy, is classical, right? Classical style. This is a diagram from um, Steven Pinker's book on style. There he talks about different kinds of writing styles uh, and use of language in general. Um, classical style, or classical prose, is what I think is an end ideal of a piece of analytic philosophy. There's a kind of transparency of language um, taken from the classical style where the um, archetype is Descartes, right? There's an underlying picture to it, a theory involved about this style of using language. Um, and the, the picture is language is a window onto the world, right? Um, language is primarily, you think about it as a conversation between two people, so language is oral, right? And so your writing should, to the best extent possible, um, reflect, be conversational, um, and it's a conversational, it's a, it's a conversation between a reader and a writer where their attention is directed to something that the writer can see and the reader cannot. And therefore, the way that you use language is to direct the reader's gaze to the thing that only you can see. So one of the kinds of um, exercises that I do with my students is I have like one student blindfolded and another student like describe to that student who's blindfolded how to go about navigating the room, right? And I said, if your prose is as clear as that, then you have succeeded. And if your prose is like, like if you would read a paper, like if you had a paper that you wrote and it was trying to, you know, direct the attention of somebody to something and they just don't get it, then you failed, at least in the classical style. Now this is not every style, Right? But this is, this is the classical style. Um, another way of putting it that people, um, people say is that, uh, at least in this kind of philosophy, your prose needs to be so clear that if you've made any mistakes, it's immediately obvious to your reader that you've made the mistake. Okay, now, um, so this is not to say that everyone succeeds at this. If you've ever been in a philosophy course or read a piece of philosophy, <laughs> you might think that's just not right, it's just wrong. Yeah, right, it's an ideal of it, I think. I think it's, it's an ideal, um, it's an aim. Um, so I think that storytelling, especially oral storytelling, of which current podcasting is a part, shares, at least in my view, the classical style. In fact, it's almost definitional of oral storytelling in that it's a conversation <laughs> between two people where one is trying to direct the other person's mental gaze, gaze towards an object of joint attention, in which case events and so on. Good storytellers do this well, bad storytellers do this poorly. So in that they share, I think, the style. What they don't share, I think, are, at least obviously, are these other aims of storytelling besides direction of joint attention towards an object. Um, oral storytelling does not usually have a thesis philosophy does. Oral storytelling requires narrative structures and decisions, many of which are done for reasons other than epistemological reasons, other than reasons of providing evidence and justification, right? So for instance, um, there are aims of mystery and suspense, right? There's this joke that if a philosopher wrote a mystery novel, it would sound like this. In chapter one, I'm gonna tell you who the you know, murderer is in chapter two, we're gonna, right? I mean, that's how it would sound, right? Um, that's clear, <laughs> it'll direct you to the gaze, but that's just not what you would do in oral storytelling. Um, so there are these conflicting, so philosophy is primarily epistemological, almost never aesthetic, right? So for instance, right? Um, very few writers are, for the decisions that they're making are making a decision based on 
um, some kind of aesthetic quality. Sometimes they might do it for suspense, but you might get a reviewer that says, just tell me what this is up front, right? Don't try to hold off on what you're trying to say until later and so on. Um, so, okay, so that's just the setup, right? Um, there's a sense in which sometimes I do want the storytelling to have a thesis when I do a project like this. Why? Well, because I'm trying to integrate a particular story with a piece of philosophy. And sometimes what that means is that the story is in the service of a thesis. If it's not mine, it's somebody else's thesis. Um, and there is something sometimes dista dis distasteful about that. Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean something like this. Someone tells you a story, and then the next thing they say is, and the lesson of this story is X, Y, Z. And I'll tell you why this is the lesson of that story. That's a bit distasteful sometimes, right? Um, uh, not always, but sometimes. And I think that that's the thing um, that I want to talk about um, today. It's a conflict that arose almost immediately when I started this project, which went right up to the last episode. I don't quite know how to resolve it today, but I've been thinking about it since I, since it was, um, um, since the series finished running, which was I finished this last episode. It was one of the more emotional episodes because it really it followed mothers through uh, different stages of life, and not just that, but like the trials and tribulations of different stages of life, um, the 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 tension, the difficulties and anxieties that occur with having a newborn, all the way to caring for your parents when they're older and watching them sort of lose faculties and all the way to somebody who had to deal with her mother's death. And then I was done and then I got this letter from a listener. Uh, and that's going to be sort of the, um, what I'll use to open up the issue that I want to talk about. I'm going to let you um, read this letter a little bit. So um, I just want to say I, I I wasn't bothered by this letter. Um, I'm not some I'm not it's, I'm not somebody who's like completely immune to being affected negatively by critic by negative criticism. Um, but for this particular, I also don't just dismiss people as trolls or anything like that. Um, but when I got this reaction, uh, my first thought was, um, yeah, I could see how someone might think that about some of the episodes. I don't think it's true about of most of them. But I could see what, what they're thinking. But what it made me have to think more about is, um, is, well, integrating storytelling and philosophy. Why? Why did I have to think that? Well, what were some of these concerns? Well, I just listed like the big buzzwords. Journalistic integrity, value judgments, continued critiques versus total write-offs, laying the foundation for a particular worldview, intense emotional appeal, what they called ethically problematic. Um, I would be more conscious of the way that your critiques come across so that your audience might remain diverse. Um, um, you might wonder, like, let me just go straight to the examples. Like, so there's I, actually only over the course of 10 episodes, um, um, there might have only been really three moments um, that I think I actually did come out and say, like, that's not a good argument for the following reasons, right? Which is what, which is what like, we do. As philosophers, right? Like this, that's that's just what we do. Um, let me give you, let me give you, let me play you two of them. There are a couple of moments. So this is the first episode, the wishes of the dead, and let me tell you a little bit about this episode. Um, the um, I did a story about how I did a story about Milton Hershey of the Hershey fortune, Hershey's, Hershey's chocolate, and um, he died seventy years ago, and he had his money put into a trust and said you could only do it this way. And since then, like use this money in this particular way. And since that moment, everybody has been doing that. Like, that's something we do, by the way. Right? When somebody passes away, we say, that money, that's still theirs. So we gotta do what they want with it. In fact, if that money grows, the growth of that money is still theirs. We gotta do something. That's the thing that I investigated in this story. Like, if you think about it, they're dead. <laughs> what? They're still theirs? Right? What? No, it's still theirs in the sense that we all think that it's still theirs and we all exercise that, but like, but they're dead, right? And so the question is like, 
and so some philosophers have talked about, um, no, it's right, it's still theirs. It's in fact, if you fail to fulfill their wishes, you're doing harm to them, right? And so I was like, okay, let me look at what those arguments are. And this is the one episode where I was actually pretty, and it's the first one, pretty openly thought, these are bad arguments. But this is the moment, right, where that happens. I'm talking about, a, I'm addressing a philosopher who argues that if you don't respect the wishes of the, of the dead, you're harming a, per, uh, a, a dead person. Right? Barbara Baum Levenbuch uses a story to argue this point. In the story, there's a character named Jane. Jane goes into a reversible coma. She will come out. And people do terrible things to Jane. She's not aware of it, and she never will be. But she's still harmed. And then I change it to an irreversible coma. And this doesn't change the fact that Jane is harmed. And then I just go into the and she's newly dead. You can't draw a principled line at the newly dead there either. The argument goes that being dead is just another way of not being aware of how people are treating you. Like being ignorant, or asleep, or in a coma. I just don't buy it. I think this reasoning trades on our disgust at people who do anything to comatose or dead people. And I really do think there's a difference between doing disgusting things, things that make you a horrible person, and actually harming someone. Here's an example from Waco, Texas, October 16, 2016. Teenagers filmed themselves mutilating an already dead dog. Okay. Disgusting, vile, horrible people. Thank goodness it wasn't harmful to the dog. Also, being dead isn't the same as being in a coma. Being dead is a way of not being in the world, period. We don't talk about other things that aren't in the world as though they can be harmed, like Santa Claus or Harry Potter. Okay, so I... So if you've ever taken a philosophy class, that's like pretty standard kind of like what we do as professors. Like here's some argument. It's like, yeah, it's just, you know. Um, so that's like the one, so here, that's one example that I want to use. Like there, there's a piece of philosophy that came at the end of a story. Um, the other one is a little bit more fun. Um, so I did an episode about mashups. Um, mashups are, <laughs> everybody knows what a mashup is. Okay. Um, <laughs> Deborah, <laughs> it's when you take one song and then you play it simultaneously with another song and it just happens to go together very well. Um, and, um, and they have to be pop music. And, um, and so there I talked about this philosopher, Theodore Adorno, who like hates pop music. So he criticized pop music on a lot of grounds. Um, so some of the things that he said were things like, um, pop music all sounds the same, right? Um, pop mu music makes people dumb. It makes them subservient to a, a to um, the desires of capitalism, right? And all this stuff like that. Um, okay, and so, um, so this is a part where I'm like, okay, I just presented all of Adorno. Oh yeah, and then finally I say, and so mashups are like the worst of the worst of pop music. Like you, it's, like, it's like liking junk food, right? But then on top of that, you take like hot dog and you put it in a stuffed crust pizza, right? And then like, and then you put a hamburger on top of that. That's a mashup, right? And so like it's worse than even just the, all right, so, 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 here's, so here's, like, I, so I actually respond to Adorno. But I'm just not that sympathetic to criticisms of art that speculate about how it poisons the mind and leads to the downfall of society. It's speculation with really weak evidence. I don't hear a lot of pop when I watch videos of Nazi rallies, but I do hear a lot of Wagner. So what gives? Did Adorno just hate pop and found in philosophy a way to justify his hatred of it? Or did he really hate it because of all the reasons he gives? Because, first of all, there's this. The composer Grant Woolard on YouTube mashed up 57 pieces of classical music in one track and then made a follow-up where he mashed up an additional 53. So talk about what all sounds the same. Yeah, all pop music does sound the same, but so does all classical music. And if you take a far enough, far enough lens, you know, so does music, basically, because everything is built on a pre-existing structure. If you're going to write a song, it's going to be in verse-chorus format. If you're 
going to write a symphony, your first movement is going to be in sonata form. The genius, I think, is taking these kind of pre-existing structures that we use and being creative enough with it to have something new. I think you find out more interesting things about music when you take for granted that music within a genre or pre-existing structure is all going to sound similar. So why not ask the question, what makes for a good piece of work in that genre and why? Okay, so, um, so these are the examples, like that's only one more example out of 10 episodes where I actually do something like that. Okay, so, um, so knowing that, I didn't feel too bad about being like this master manipulator, trying to get people to like do stories and then like presenting them a worldview. Most likely because I assumed that, okay, maybe this guy hasn't had philosophy or much, but like that's sort of what we do. We kind of like take some views and then like criticize them and so on and so forth. But it did raise this, um, this other issue for me, which is that what did this particular listener want as an alternative? Right? And I think the listener wanted something like um, the show presents a story, then presents some kind of philosophical view, and then balances that out with some other kind of philosophical view without ever bother to criticizing or editorializing or anything like that. Right? And there was this other, one other negative review um, on, um, on iTunes where a guy criticized the show on the grounds that for, for the first episode, Wishes of the Dead, he said, you didn't take the afterlife seriously. Like you didn't even present the view that we can harm the dead because they're still living, like in the afterlife, and that everything we do to them will like really piss them off, right? And that's true. I didn't present that view in that episode. Um, the irony is, is that I actually had a 20-second segment in which I did, except I cut it out, and because I thought nobody's going to take this seriously, <laughs> right? I, and so, I, right, and so I just said, so I cut it out. That's the irony. Like I actually did thought that in order to balance, I have to present some kind of afterlife view. Anyways, um, so, and I, and I thought to myself, okay, um, you know, that's just a different kind of show that this person wants. That would be a journalist doing like, like a show where they like learn about philosophy from different people and then like kind of present it. And like, I'm not a journalist and I don't pretend to be and I would probably be pre a pretty bad one. Um, I'm a trained, you know, philosophy professor, person. Um, and I could do a purely expository show, um, but then there would be no way of kind of modeling the kind of thinking that a philosopher might do when encountering stories and so on. I think that was important. But, but, um, oh, and then there's this other thing that I thought about, right? So, which is that um, the whole complaint about, you know, continued critiques, total write-offs, laying the foundation for a worldview, um, and, um, and value judgments, Right, um, so these are some of my responses to, to these complaints. Um, any intro to media criticism student will tell you that um, the effective propagandist is a subtle one. They incorporate their value judgments and worldviews in the editing process and they don't come out and say them, right? Um, that's actually better and more effective. But it doesn't mean that it's not people who are doing some, something to the work to advance an agenda or a worldview, right? Um, so, um, is that bad, <laughs> right? I just, I think that just is, <laughs> right? Um, but if we want to move past that, I had to think, what do I want High Fi Nation to be as I was doing this, right? This is the first season. And there is this worry that I think I share with um, this particular listener. Um, and the reason is, when I started doing the show after that first episode, there were comparisons that some of my colleagues and some listeners made to Malcolm Gladwell, right? And, um, which I kind of I like Malcolm Gladwell, honestly. But in particular, there's like this one moment in Gladwell, he decided to do his own podcast, um, did, and this raised a lot of attention, not just because um, of where I teach, but also in public media as well. Let me give you the background. Um, Gladwell is doing a story about Vassar, my institution, and he's comparing Vassar to another college, Bowdoin. Um, and this premise is the food at Bowdoin is really good, and the food at Vassar really sucks, right? And that's true. Um, um, Bowdoin also doesn't spend a lot of money on financial aid for um, lower socioeconomic kids, and Vassar does. And that's the... Um, and Catherine Bonhill is our president. That's, that was her mission. Okay? So 
This, this, this is Gladwell. I want, I'm going to ask you for comments about this, so listen carefully. I cannot get over how excited this kid is about the food of Bowdoin. Do you think he talks this way about his professors? Oh, have you tried things that, like you wouldn't have tried otherwise? Like, what kind of, what kind of meals or dishes? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> the other night I had an eggplant parmesan pancake. I, you know, I don't think I could have even told you that was a real thing until I had it. You know, I walked past and didn't grab one, and I went back, uh, uh, might as well. And it was phenomenal. I had six, actually. Eggplant parmesan pancake. I mean, this is completely absurd. This is everything that's wrong with American colleges. We had venison here during deer season. It was really just fresh, locally sourced, different kinds of meats that I would never expect to see in a college dining hall. There's only one solution. If you're looking at liberal arts colleges, don't go to Bowdoin. Don't let your kids go to Bowdoin. Don't let your friends go to Bowdoin. Don't give money to Bowdoin or to any other school that serves amazing food in its dining hall. Because every time you support a school that spends its money on amazing food, every time you cast a vote in favor of eggplant, parmesan, pancakes, and lobster bakes and venison during deer season, you're making it harder and harder for someone like Catherine Hill to create opportunities for poor kids. Suck it up and go to Vassar. Okay. So tell me what you feel about that. How do you feel about that? Tell me how you feel about that. Yeah? There are a couple of things. It was designed a little bit more to be funny, and there's sort of like that background, sort of suspenseful music. And so his criticism is framed much more in the absurd, humorous. Yeah. 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 I mean, if we're expected to take it seriously, it's not a very good argument because it makes a zero sum argument that, like, you can only spend food on food. <laughs> you can only spend, sorry, you can only spend money on food or you can spend money on admitting low income yeah. students and not per death, per perhaps both. Do people like that piece? Who, who didn't like it? Okay. Why don't, why don't you like it? Yeah. Yeah. You liked it? Yeah. Did you? I don't, well, um, <laughs> I've also seen something I'm pretty sure from him that's about. It was about him saying, don't donate to Princeton because yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, I work at the annual fund, and a lot of what he says, like, he was talking about the endowment and whatnot, and it's just wrong. <laughs> like, when you donate, yeah. that's not going to go to the endowment. Endowments are meant to be spent, going to be most likely to Princeton's annual fund and with fund academics and whatnot. Just what he is saying, where the money's going, is wrong, <laughs> for the most part. So that's why I just don't like that. But it was funny. <laughs> I think if you agree with him, you would have liked, you would like it a lot. Um, so let me tell you something that, um, um, yeah, so, so, so Gladwell gets a lot of stuff wrong all the time, by the way, right? But this whole thing where he lionizes my own institution, he gets the facts wrong, right? He actually says all these things about how, you know, they were so heroic and not cutting faculty and class, increasing class sizes and all that. And anybody, all you that know, you do not balance a budget by the food, right? Like it's like it's it's always it's always labor that's like the highest, right? Anyways, um, but in in public radio, this is what they were bothered by the blowhardiness of the narrator, right? Like you just you don't say, "Don't go to Bowdoin." Like that, could you imagine like Terry Gross saying that, right? Like like oh, it's. Here's the, like, not, just, not just saying, oh, so you're saying that we shouldn't go to vote, vote it, right? You have to you just say, don't go to, don't give them money, don't, right, that. So it was that that really bothered them. Um, um, and there's a, there's a kind of person who's really turned off by blowhardiness, right? And, and sometimes, not all the time, I think that a call for objectivity or something like that or balance in journalism comes from that kind of distaste. Now, personally, I'm not that, I don't really worry that much about blowhardiness. I kind of like it sometimes. Um, um, I'm far from a blowhard on my show um, because I have a distaste for that. Um, in fact, sometimes it comes off to a fault. There's an episode where I did about parapsychology where I actually give them so much more like charity than people thought. Like my wife was like, how could you be harder on people who honor the wishes of the dead than the psychic researchers? <laughs> Which I was, because I was like so afraid that, you know, like, God, I can't be hard on these, they're poor, these poor people, right? But like, that's how I felt. Um, on the other hand, um, when philosophy is not just expository, when it takes a stand, it has 
the effect of being blowhardy in a certain way. You take a stand about what are good and bad reasons and you say that. Um, and so long as we take our tradition back, back to Plato, that's something that you know, we do. Anyways, so it made me think about this notion of objectivity and truth and fairness and balance in the media that I like now kind of have to think about because I'm no longer producing philosophy. And it made me think about the difference between say Fox News and MSNBC and BBC and NPR and so forth. And what I thought about that, what I thought about the value, like what value is a certain kind of um, tone at least of objectivity and balance um, adding in a way that like just nothing but blowhardiness, you know, you know, um, doesn't. And, um, and lucky enough, I have a PhD in philosophy where I focus on epistemology, right? And I had, so I think, so I thought a little bit about the value of these things from the point of view of like, are these views, are, are, is this idea that, you know, BBC and NPR, um, where you have this kind of, um, I don't even know how to describe it. I'm not going to say that they are objective or they are um, fair and balanced. I'm just going to say there is at least a pretense of it. Um, maybe there's an actuality, right? Um, and what do I think about that? And I think this is what I think about this, that, right? I actually have considered um, and considered views about like objectivity and truth and reason and so forth. And I'm just going to tell you what they are, maybe without arguing, which is that every truth is objectively true. If it's true, it's objectively true. If it's true, it's true. It's, there's no other way, right? Um, evaluative language, what's good and bad reason, you know, uh, what's right and wrong things, are true or false. And if they are, they're objectively true and objectively false. Um, so for instance, I think the word, you know, asshole, right, which you would never hear someone on NPR call somebody else, um, they might have an entire episode about the word asshole, but they'll never call somebody that. But I think the word asshole picks out a set of objective properties. Like these are the conditions that make somebody an asshole. And if someone satisfies that, it's true that they're an asshole. And if it's true that they're an asshole, they're objectively an asshole. I think that's true. I don't think that's, like I, I really do believe that, right? And so I don't think it's not objective when somebody calls somebody an asshole, if they're an asshole. They're wrong if their person is not an asshole, okay? Now, so that's an, so an asshole might be an evaluative piece of language. Now, now, you might say, okay, but then how do you know somebody's asshole? Because that's an epistemic point now, right? It's like, like nobody should be as confident as they are about whether so-and-so is an asshole. I think that's wrong, by the way. I think some people can be pretty confident that somebody is an asshole. But, but, then, but then, so you have to have this balance. Well, I don't think that balance is on its own an epistemically good thing. I think that it can be misleading, right? And you know, the, you know, if, if a certain kind of view has 97% evidential support and another has 3%, then at most you should spend 3% of the time balancing out that view. And if you don't, that's misleading. That's presenting evidence as though it's as good evidence as this other evidence, right? And that's a bad thing, right? From the point of view of like, like knowledge, right? And so I, so, so, so what's, so, if I don't think that objectivity and fairness and balancing have these epistemic aims, like what value do they have then? Um, I have to think about that because like, because at the end of the day, do I want to become Gladwell, right? And say, stop giving to institutions that honor the wishes of the dead. I came so close to saying that and the wishes of the dead. I didn't, I just, but, right? But I came very close to saying that because I, you know, anyways. Um, and so luckily for me, and I have 10 minutes left, left so good. Luckily for me that, you know, as I was struggling with this question throughout, um, I ended up doing an episode. I had the opportunity to interview actually somebody famous. <laughs> um, I, got, I got to interview uh, the filmmaker Errol Morris. Uh, Errol Morris is a documentary filmmaker. He made the films The Thin Blue Line and The Fog of War and so on. And, um, and after I interviewed him, which was a long wandering, really weird interview, um, I had to make a show about him. And I went to the CDS here at Duke uh, and talked to Tom Rankin, who um, teaches documentary um, studies there. And he, I got to talking to him about you know, this very issue. And the, here's the context of the conversation. We're talking about the difference between Michael Moore as a documentary filmmaker and Errol Morris as a documentary filmmaker. And in many respects, Michael Moore is a lot like the Gladwell guy, right? And then, then, then there's Errol Morris, okay? And so here's, here's what Tom had to say. 
I think of Errol Morris, I mean, it probably is his philosophy background. He raises the questions. He's less certain where we ought to go with all the answers. And he's more interested in the complexity of the discourse than a singular um, one thing leads to another, leads to another, and then we get to the conclusion. Every time Michael Moore would have a film, when I was directing the center, I would get these calls from journalists saying, you know, is this really a documentary? That was always the question, no matter how they asked it. But it's like a, a very large media opinion piece, op-ed piece, that is in the form of, of a documentary. That question always assumed that documentaries are somehow objective and other things are not. Errol Morris is, is he's not interested in the singular final interpretation of anything. He may want you, us to understand that a singular message or a singular conclusion, but it's not. It's not like he's going to wrap it up with a bow at the end. I mean, Michael Moore is a he's he's a political activist. I mean, is is a Michael Moore film as poetic as a uh, uh, Errol Morris film? So I want you to focus on that. Is a Michael is an Errol Michael Moore film as poetic as a Errol Morris film? Now, after speaking to Errol, I can I can vouch that Tom's wrong about one thing. Errol does have a thesis in his films, okay? Um, for those of you who've seen The Thin Blue Line, The Thin Blue Line is about a murder in Texas and somebody who was falsely convicted. Um, no narrator says somebody has been falsely convicted. Nobody actually explicitly confesses. There's something really close to a confession from the actual murder. In fact, in that film, Errol never even depicts what he thinks really happened in that film. And yet, right, people read it as, oh, this is a film about him trying to exonerate somebody who was falsely convicted, which he did, actually. And that was a name. But he didn't do it in the same way, say, Michael Moore would. Let me play you a couple of clips. This is Mike from Michael Moore's Sicko. Um, and I just want to, here's a pairwise comparison of um, Michael Moore and Errol Morris, where I think that they are actually trying to say something. They're arguing for a thesis of a certain kind, and they're using the documentary form to do that, but they're doing it in the distinctively Michael Moore way and the distinctively Errol Morris way, right? So here's Michael Moore. She drove Washington insane. Do you really want the federal government to control your health care? You won't have a choice of your own doctor. Yeah. Government mandates. Less government. More government control. More government. And less control for you and your family. When your mama gets sick, she might talk to a bureaucrat instead of a doctor. This is a total mess, and it's about to get messier. Not this big bureaucratic socialist okay. plan that they have. Socialist takeover. Socialized medicine. What really amounts to a giant social experiment. <laughs> Socialized medicine. Nothing put more fear in us than the thought of that. Okay. All right. So even the so the do, 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 even that is very distinctly Michael Moore. He uses pretty stock and well-known pieces of classical music. There was this later in the film when he actually lists the um, pre-existing conditions that exclude you from getting health care. He uses the Star Wars theme and the angled like credits from Star Wars. Right. Okay. All right, so this is Errol Morris. This is from The Fog of War, where he, it's a whole film about Robert McNamara, who was the um, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, during um, the start of the Vietnam War. The choice of incendiary bombs, where did that come from? I think the, the, the issue is not so much incendiary bombs. I think the issue is, in order to win a war, should you kill 100,000 people in one night by firebombing or any other way? LeMay's answer would be clearly yes. McNamara, do you mean to say that instead of killing 100,000, burning to death 100,000 Japanese civilians in that one night, we should have burned to death a lesser number or none, and then had our soldiers cross the beaches in Tokyo and been slaughtered in the tens of thousands? Is that what you're proposing? Is that moral? Is that wise? Why was it necessary to drop the nuclear bomb if LeMay was burning up Japan? And he went on from, from Tokyo to firebomb other cities. 58% of Yokohama, Yokohama is roughly the size of Cleveland. 58% of Cleveland destroyed. Tokyo is roughly the size of New York. 51% of New York destroyed. 
99% of the equivalent of Chattanooga, which was Toyama. 40% of the equivalent of Los Angeles, which was Nagoya. This was all done before the dropping of the nuclear bomb, which, by the way, was dropped by LeMay's command. Proportionality should be a guideline in war. Okay, so that's that's Errol Morris, right? Um, and that's the scene where McNamara comes as close as he ever does into saying that he was a war criminal. Right? Um, he never actually says that. He says, some will say that I was a war criminal. Now, if we had lost the war, like he, that's how he would get qualified. And Errol doesn't interject in any way. In fact, he very rarely, his voice very rarely appears in that film. OK, let's get to the point that I, I, I really want to make, um, which is that um, now, yeah, there, I, this is what I have to think about, right? Um, there's, what is it about an Errol Morris film, which I think has a stated thesis also, just like in a Michael Moore film, but doesn't have what I'll call this blowhardy quality where the narrator actually as, probably asserts certain claims um, and has at least more of a, an appearance of balance, right, in it? Um, what value is, does that add if, it's, if I don't think it's epistemological? Well, here's, this is my tentative thesis. I think it's an aesthetic value, right? Because an aesthetic value, that's not an epistemological value. In fact, it could go run count, counter to um, knowledge. Um, and that aesthetic value is, um, is, is found like in this pairwise comparison. It, it made me think about something that I learned back when I was an English major in college. Um, Anne Radcliffe, who uh, the Gothic novelist um, drew this famous distinction between terror and horror. If you're an English major, you might have heard this in 19th century Gothic fiction. Recently, my wife made me start watching this, this series called Penny Dreadful on Netflix. Does you know what that is? Okay, if you don't know what that is, Penny Dreadful is kind of like, like, like fan fiction gone off the rails, right? It's like, what happens if the werewolf and Frankenstein and vampires all like existed together and like they collaborated against the devil and so on and so forth. And I'm watching it, and it's like, it's OK. I, I kind of don't like it. Um, but I don't like it. There was a lot of what, it, what I didn't like, which was like, there's actually a lot, I think, of gratuitous showing of blood and sex and violence and so on. Um, it made me think back to this distinction between terror and horror that Radcliffe, right? Horror is like the horror film. There is blood. There is guts. There is gore, right? And there might be explicit you know, sex and things like that. And then terror is the thriller. And what is that dif distinction, right? Terror is characterized by obscurity or indeterminacy in its treatment of potentially horrible events. It's the difference between showing a vampire sinking their teeth with the blood running down and then the blood coming off, and that about to happen and closing the door and hearing a scream, right? That's the difference between terror and horror. Um, this is Radcliffe's own words. Obscurity or indistinctness is only a negative which leaves the imagination to act upon the few hints that truth reveals to it. Obscurity leaves something for the imagination to exaggerate. And I think that there's something that's the counterpart to that with like when you're trying to do like more public facing things, story driven for some kind of thing you're arguing for, in the aesthetic value, not necessarily the epistemic value of slightly obscuring the point that you're trying to argue for, and that that is what I think the listener might end up be picking, picking up upon. Like, I think everything ends up having some kind of worldview. Nothing is metaphysically neutral. But I do think that there's an aesthetic preference right, for one form rather than another. And I think that, that you find this everywhere. right? Um, it's not just in like, the presentation of a view versus like the editorial decisions and story structuring that gets somebody there without actually having somebody assert it. This actually occurs in everyday life between, I think we have a preference generally to, um, in certain contexts for somebody to hint or have an innuendo or what we call in philosophy an implicature rather than baldly asserting. 
something. So here, a famous example is if you're on a first date, right, and everybody has a good time, and one person says, would you like to come upstairs and look at my etchings, okay? <laughs> now, you're, you're laughing, right? But compare that to, this. I had a really great time. Let's go upstairs and have sex. That's a bald assertion. The first case, everybody knows what's going on, right? But it's veiled, right? It's veiled in such a way that we seem to have a preference for it in that kind of context. And what is that doing that we have a preference for that? And I think that this is the kind of thing that's going on, um, even in you know, storytelling for purposes of, of a thesis. Well, I'm, not, I'm out of time. So I, this is my tentative thesis. I have a thesis, um, which is that storytelling without evaluative language, presenting positions that are balanced, narration without criticism or value judgment, it's an aesthetic and not primarily epistemic value. right? And I like, well, you can challenge me on this. But it's, it, this is the kind of thing that I have to think about. Now, what, what do I want my show to be? What do I want story-driven for some kind of intellectual purpose? And, and this is a step towards like, OK, like if this is an aesthetic value, then you know, what is it good for? Is that aesthetic value that I want, that I can achieve, and so on. Anyways, uh, I'm done for, for today. Q&A. Allison. But one thing I would throw out as, as, as a uh, concept that might be interesting to think about is the idea of intellectual humility. Um, I think that good journalism has, has that quality just as good scholarship does. And I think that has not only an aesthetic component to it, but uh, result. You know, when, when one approaches a uh, scholarly or journalistic topic with intellectual humility, meaning I have these ideas, but I might be wrong. Um, one is going to produce, uh, uh, the reader hears the authenticity in the pursuit. The reader hears the openness of spirit that someone is bringing to it. And I think that results in us, in both of it more aesthetically appealing, but also a more substantively different kind of fun. I think I agree with you that it's different. Here's, <laughs> Um, here's, here's where I would push back. Is intellectual humility a virtue in and of itself, or is it because it serves better? Like, you're likelier to get truth through intellectual humility. I'm skeptical of the second thing, actually. I think in some contexts it might be, but in others it might not. Right? I, I think that... Um, some people who are overconfident might be justifiably overconfident because they have an enormous amount of evidence, right? And, and if they are intellectually humble, that's a virtue, but not a virtue that's epistemic. So I'm drawing a distinction here, right? A virtue that's epistemic is a virtue that's in service of like more knowledge, right? Um, maybe being overly skeptical when you shouldn't be leads you to less knowledge. But if it's a virtue, it's, a, it's another kind of virtue. And does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? I, I'm not convinced yet, maybe Walter will convince me, that epistemic humility is, I'm convinced it's a virtue. I like humble people. I don't like low, hard, low hardy people. But I'm not convinced that it's because I think those people are likelier to be right it's because I kind of like them more. <laughs> They're more fun. There's like maybe a social virtue to it, or right? Yeah. <laughs> but I guess I have a real question about how cultural diversity aligns with, with this knowledge of truth. So when you were talking about the rights of the dead, I was thinking about Edmund Burke's philosophy um, at the time of the French Revolution. <clears throat> that you do need to respect the rights of the dead. And that has been critiqued throughout the, the history of um, modernity as a very nationalist, paternalistic kind of philosophy. But when you study world cultures that are profoundly different from ours, um, like, uh, say, West African cultures, where um, the, uh, the, the cultural inheritance from ancestors is really can't be separated from the inheritance of, of divine traditions. It really is all one. 
in that kind of a context, it, it plays totally differently. And, um, and I wouldn't know how to say that, that that kind of truth about the ongoing legacies of the ancestors was in any way, you know, false, even if from the standpoint of a, so how do you, how do you deal with that question of cultural difference? That's a really hard question. I think, so, so one of the things that, um, in that particular episode, that I was most wor worried about was when the wishes of the dead actually conflict with what the living need, and that it actually imposed a cost, sometimes a serious cost, on the living. But it seemed that everybody still like respected the wish of the dead. In fact, felt like, well, I guess there's nothing we can do about it. And, and when you kind of, when you think about this, this particular question in a different cultural context, um, if we're talking about a context in which, look, like the culture is so intertwined with the, like the wishes of previous generations that there isn't ever a cost to the living um, there. It's like their whole life is built around it. Then I'm not that worried about it, right? So I'm only worried about it when I feel like there's a kind of injustice involved and it's an intergenerational injustice. Like there's something that's holding back current generations because they feel obliged. And, and I think that questioning that obligation, I, questioning that obligation I think is something that you can do even in different cultures. Now how you would respect it while you're questioning is, a diff, is, a, is just a tough question in general. Like how do you, you know, when, when people talk about um, certain ritualistic cultures that we in the West find abhorrent. Like um, female genital mutilation is one of these issues that it's difficult for philosophers to talk about. Like, well, we want to um, say that that's wrong and we want to prohibit it, but yet it comes up against a long tradition. I don't see that. This I think this issue is similar to that in, in just being a general issue of how do we criticize a perceived injustice while respecting, I don't know if that answers your question, while respecting the, the culture. I think that I saw some students of, yeah. Sure, uh, I, I think my <clears throat> question, thought, comment is um, sort of related to, I think, what, what Deborah was asking, but more so as far as, um, can, you, can you talk a little bit more, I guess, like, so, so I'm a sociologist, so we talk about, and a qualitative sociologist, so we talk about positionality, right? Yeah. And so even the decision making on, like, the topics that you're choosing, right, for the different episodes matters, right? And, and that sort of, like, leads the, the audience to recognize, like, where your, right, worldview is actually coming yeah. from. And, and so I guess I, I was a little bit more, wanted to hear more. I think you put up there one of the, the <clears throat> one of the rebuttals to the comments uh, as far as, um, sort of like the worldview comment was that like, well, there are different philo philosophical positions. And so I guess for me not being, uh, I guess it, it involved in any sort of like philosophy or, or not having taken classes, how is that different from, right, like your personal positions? Um, so, so like if I'm starting off, so if I'm doing a podcast, like the first episode will probably be, I'm a Latino woman. Yeah. Like, yeah, so that I think versus like, how does that differ from philosophical positions? And, and are you trying to make the podcast more about the philosophical positions and not even tackle sort of the positionality as far as like personal? I have been very, I don't think people care about me generally. That sounds weird, sorry. I, I, I don't, I haven't inserted the first person all that much when it comes to the kind of th things you're talking about. There, there's an orientation that I have that is almost in every episode. And I think it's an orientation. So I, I, I'm, I'm a pretty diehard realist in what they call realism, realism in philosophy, which is I think that there are answers to questions. I don't think, when, when, like when I hear students say, there's no right answer. No, there is a right answer. I think that we might not know it, 
but I think there is one. That, that's a position that I've, that I've come to hold. And I think that um, that's something that I, that's a presupposition. Um, so that I would say that I have a lot of presuppositions. Um, and the positionality plays a role in that. Um, the presupposition I'm very conscious of when I'm engaging with that. In terms of like where I come from, I haven't had an episode where I've had to, that I've wanted to yet to use that as the starting point. But I'm very conscious of the fact that I do have this position. You know, the very fact that I didn't include an afterlife, and I'm an atheist, right? I didn't include an afterlife, and I thought, the fact that I thought to cut it because no one would care about that when probably 90% of the world cares more about that than like Milton Hershey's, you know, example is an example of where I've just like actually deployed and just ran roughshod over, you know, based on the assumptions that I started out with. Um, Carlos? Yeah. Yeah, I want to follow up on that same yeah. line of questions. So you start off with your, your entry point is this letter um, from your listener, yeah. which interestingly you didn't read out loud, right? Yeah. So it's sort of like, <laughs> doesn't see yourself from that point of letter. Yeah. But the letter is asking you to sort of, um, to think about the possibility of being more aware of listeners with other points of view, right? right. Um, and then you lead into these two examples, right? Um, and I also want to go back to the, the dark one, because I found it very interesting. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me, so you talk about the dead, and you're like, well, you can't respect the dead, which is the dead because they're dead, right? They're not coming to us, they're dead, right? And, and you, you present that in a kind of humorous way, you talk about the dead dog, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then I was sort of, and then I was sort of, and then you talk about sort of the, the 10, 20 second episode a segment on the afterlife, but then you cut it because yeah. it means nothing to you, yeah. right? Um, so I guess my question here would be your response or your talk, your discussion of that episode seems to sort of circle back to the questions that were being raised by your anonymous listener, which is the question of awareness of other points of view, right? Because it seems to me that the question of the dead is not even necessarily the epistemological question of whether the dead ha can have wishes or not, right? I mean, sure, some people may believe in the afterlife, I personally don't, but I recognize that other people do, right? And similarly, I recognize that people are dead, but for many people, the dead continue to live on to, in, 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 in very real ways, right? Like if I have a family member that dies, you know, that, that person, individual would still continue to have a great deal of presence in my life. And the same thing happens with big donors, right? I mean, they, 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 they may be dead, but people that value their memory still live on, and in some ways, this is part of the reason that people make donations, right? Is because they're trying to create a legacy, not only for themselves after they become dead, but for the people that will, 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 will live on. And, so, and there's an entire body of, 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 of law that is, is constructed around how to negotiate this, this, this transition from um, the living to the dead, right? I mean, you have wills that are legally binding, you have uh, copyright law that remains in effect for you know, two generations. Um, and, and so it seems to me that the question really is not what you as an individual think about the rights of someone who is no longer living, but rather the, the, the real question, the real philosophical question, excuse me, um, the more nuanced way that you, you just articulated in response to Deborah's question, which is, how you negotiate in a context-specific way um, perceived conflicts between uh, uh, the wishes of someone who is no longer alive and the sort of more immediate pressing concerns of, among the living, rather than simply saying someone is dead, therefore their, their wishes are no longer relevant, right? And also, the, the other sort of related question is not so much what the wishes, what the status of the, the dead is, right? Um, whether they can be harmed or they cannot be harmed, but rather whether you're harm the question of whether you're harming the people for whom that individual continues to matter, right? Which seems to be a very relevant question. Yeah. 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 But you seem to be just dismissing that entire question by no, 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 the death is the dead. You seem to be dismissing that entire question of the ways in which um, these decisions of whether to respect, whether or not to respect the wishes of the dead might in fact be impacting other people that are in fact still alive and have uh, are part of this. No, it's not. So, so Carlos, the, the whole episode is about all of these those other questions. The segment that you heard was was a response to one argument 
that somebody made that there is literal harm to the dead when you fail to respect their wishes using the example of a person who's been comatose and then newly dead. But the rest of the, you know, I go through the legal, the, 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 the whole legal infrastructure, right? And, and I talk about how in certain cir circumstances, um, so for instance, if the dead person wanted you never to remarry, right? Like at least in this culture, we go, okay, well, you know, good for them, but like that's not a wish that we respect. But more importantly, it's not one that we build into the law. Right, and so what are, so the questions, so you're right, there's this question of what do we build into the law as part of the legal infrastructure that enforces wishes of the, why is it some and not others? Like these are all of the questions that were in that episode. So it's not like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I didn't want to give the impression that I didn't think that those other questions were. Well, I mean, if I yeah. just very, very briefly, sir, well, okay. 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 we, we are just about out of time. Yeah, and so do we have some student? Yeah, I want to make sure the students get to it. Undergrads? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you can tell you have really gotten us all thinking. I see a lot of brows furrowed in, in thinking about these, these difficult questions, and we can continue to explore them by listening to your podcasts and really working through uh, these, these mazes of logic. So. Um, I think we will just thank you okay. for <laughs> launching Story Plus with such uh, a thought-provoking discussion. Thank you.